Sarah remains innocent until proved guilty by a court of law. Ever since Tob Cohen, now we can call him the late, disappeared on the 20th of July 2019, a section of the media, since I'm talking to the media, I will not be personal because you won't carry it, but a section of the media have been used very carefully to run a narrative that Tob Cohen is dead and Sarah Wairimu is guilty. The climax, of course, of that narrative is really the headlines of Nation and Standard Today. I can tell you this as gentlemen and ladies of the media, Sarah and we as the defense team know nothing about what the investigators feed the media with. We don't know about a mystery man. We have seen not a single statement implicating our client. She was charged on Thursday without a single statement being included contrary to the law. We even asked, here it is, this is the charge sheet she was charged with. Signed by a very senior prosecutor called Nicholas Mutuku, who was yesterday at the scene standing behind the, D the DCI. Actually, the, DC the DPP should stand in front of the D DCI, not the other way around. He signed this charge sheet that Sarah Wairimu is guilty or is, has, is, has, uh, has, has murdered her husband. At the back page, it says, copies of the evidence which the prosecution intends to adduce at your trial are attached herewith. On Thursday, not a single statement, not a single postmortem, not a single shred of evidence was attached to this charge sheet. But there's a reason for charging her on Thursday. I go back to this. Sarah was arrested on the 28th of July, 2019. She was arrested as soon as she invoked her rights to remain silent and have a lawyer present. And she has been locked up in custody from that day. How many days are those? They are now 29? No, no, 17. Sorry, I'm sorry. They are 17 days. In 17 days, I emphasize, Sarah has had no opportunity to do anything in her house except on two occasions she was taken to take a bath and change her clothes under escort of the DCI. During that time, everyone and anyone, including the DCI, have had access to her home. Now, they had been harping in court, in the Kiambu court, in the High Court, that they are applying to treat the home of the Cohens as a scene of crime. You all know there is no requirement for the police to get an order to treat a scene as a scene of the crime. All they have to do is say a crime was committed here and seal it off for the purposes of the investigation. But why were they asking? Because they wanted an opportunity to finally say there is something we will find. In Kiambu, the magistrate said there is no law requiring uh, you to treat, uh, to, to treat any place as a scene of crime. You are at liberty to do it at your leisure. They still did not move. However, on Tuesday, the 10th of August, they called us and they said we are taking your client from Thaiga police station to her home with the scenes of crimes officers. Actually, uh, no, no, they, they did call us. And uh, they, when we got there, uh, we have pictures of that visit. She was allowed to take a bath. These are the investigating officers. These are their vehicles. These are the guys in white. They inspected uh, Mr. Cohen's car. Um, this one is important. Um, they inspected the carpets for 
all sorts of things. Uh, they inspected the golf kit. You see that? And it goes on and on. A very a minute and thorough examination of the premises. Okay? All the shoes. There was a secret room under Tob's bed. In the bedroom. It's called a panic room or something. If uh, you are robbed or something, uh, you can hide. The police didn't even know about it. Sarah said, on that spot there, by the way, she doesn't live in that bedroom. She lives in her own bedroom. That spot there, there's a room. And they went, this is the scenes of crime officer descending into that room. And it went on and on. It was thorough. Now, this is the interesting part. The kitchen. This is Sarah. She's standing every time next to them. And there's a reason. If they say this microphone is ev of evidential value, she had to acknowledge that it existed in her house. They then went to the garden. This is the interesting part. And they... This is the garden where the body was found yesterday. This is Sarah. There's a manhole here. This is them looking in the manhole. This is on Wednesday, actually, the following day. The, con the investigation continued for two days. And when they... This is them th photographing her. And she even accepted to have a DNA sample. This is her accepting, consenting to a DNA sample. They did 99% of the search. And then something... Judge Kinoti walked in on the Tuesday and walked and asked Sarah to show her her house. And she took him from room to room to room, including the garden. And when they got to the garden, something very interesting happened after they had seen this manhole, which is five meters from where the body was found. Somebody announced that we have done enough for today. We shall not continue this search today. We shall continue tomorrow. Tomorrow was the Thursday, this Thursday. And on Thursday, instead of going back to the scene, the DCI took Sarah to Melimani High Court and charged her with murder. I go back two days. On Tuesday, after the search was concluded, Inspector Otieno, Maxwell Otieno, who is one of the investigators, said, since we have not concluded our work, we require the keys of the house. Up until then, the appointees or the servants of Sarah had the keys of the house. And the watchman had the keys to the gate. And there were no policemen. And on that day, on Tuesday, they demanded the keys of the house. And they were given the keys of the house. Only God knows what they did with the keys on that night. We, however, know that Inspector Otieno, in the presence of George Uma and Eva Kala, said to the two gardeners who are looking after the premises, you will stay in your house, some SQ, and you will not come out no matter what you hear. You will stay in your house. These two boys, pictures of my, whom I have, are young boys from Nyeri. Just show me the picture of the policeman who slept here. Pictures from Nyeri, and I don't think they would have dared step out of their house on Tuesday. And on that night, it's quickly, it's uh, towards the end, uh, a police sentry was now, for the first time, took over the house. It was <coughs> there, it was there. Um, they kept the keys on Tuesday night. They told the watchmen not to, the caretakers, not to step out of the house. I, I saw it here. And those boys did not step out of the house. 
on Wednesday, they carried on with the search, I've already told you, and then they reached the point where they said, um, don't, uh, we will not finish today. And the two places, 1% of their search had not been concluded, was the corner where they found the body yesterday and the opposite corner. And I've told you, those places were not searched. They could have searched them. They didn't search them. They could have searched them in the presence of, I just put it, gave it to you, a policeman sleeping on the, on the, oh yeah, that one policeman. They could have searched the place they did not. Now I move fast forward. Tuesday, oh, and that day, as my team was leaving, the premises were taken over and an armed policeman was left to guard the premises. This is the same day Maxwell Otieno tells the two boys, don't come out of your house no matter what. Wednesday, there's a search, it stops. Two points are not searched. They go away. Thursday, we're in court. Friday, yesterday, at about two o'clock, my team had an important meeting in the Kiambu area, discussing this case with some people. And about 2.40, my colleague, George Uma, decided to call those caretakers. Find out how if everything was well. And they called Ernest. Jess, Jesse. Je Jesse. Jesse. No, who do you speak to? Jesse. Jesse. And Jesse said only two words. Wako hapa. Wako hapa. And then his phone was snatched away. We realized something was wrong. We turned our car and started driving towards uh, Lower Kabete. We then called Inspector Otieno. Initially, he didn't pick the phone. Eventually, he did. We made small talk with him, asked him, when are we going for the mental uh, assessment of Sarah? He said, well, some other time. And then he seemed to consult somebody and then said, you know, I'm proceeding to your client's home. Why don't you come? I said to Mr. Otieno, how do you proceed without us? How do you proceed without Sarah? He said, but we are going there. What for? Ah, you come if you want. We, he didn't know we were quite close. We got to the house. We found the gate closed except for a small opening. And in a classic case of gate crashing, we went into that compound. When I say gate crashing, we, simp we went, everybody became as small as me and we went through the gate. We, there was a small open.